It is Thursday, November 14th. I hope this audio sounds better <coughs> than last show. I don't know what was wrong. I know what was wrong with my voice, but I don't know what was wrong with my recording device. It sounded terrible. Um, I messed around with the... <coughs> excuse me, this cough won't go away. I messed around with the background noise settings on the recorder app that I use, Easy Voice Recorder. We'll see if that helps. And we'll see if uh, we'll see if the background noise is any different. I'm in my truck today, my F-150, which means I had to co-opt the wireless Bluetooth headset from work instead of my wired one. I just felt like driving my truck. I put new brakes on it, uh, maybe two weeks ago. And I'm not, as I've said, I'm not a, uh, I'm not a do it with your hands type of guy. So since I did all the work to get the brakes to, to get going, I thought, hey, let me drive it to work. We'll change the pace. I like to drive a pickup truck, even though it's probably a little too far to drive every day to Dalton. But I'm in downtown Dalton right now, trying to navigate my way to Walnut Avenue so I can find I-75. <coughs> the quickest way I had to come to the trophy shop to get a first place trophy for my boys my boys are going to be league champions uh, we don't think we have to win tomorrow to be the league champions so uh, I've gone ahead and bought the trophy so we could have it there for a little post game celebration it's actually the trophy I already bought for my girls team I just put another sticker on it I had the trophy guy put another sticker on it for me so that's what's going on there. And uh, roll tide, I guess, even though we're not Alabama. I just like to say roll tide. I have a full show for you today. The title of today's show is Lessened Exposure. Lessened Exposure. I have a question in the inbox about... Uh, birthrights and blessings <coughs> and as always we have the Bible chapter review today's Bible chapter review comes from Luke chapter 5 verses 12 through 14 Luke chapter 5 verses 12 through 14 Peter James and John the fishermen have just left everything to follow Jesus they went they rowed ashore parked their boats and left everything there to follow Jesus after Jesus demonstrated uh, what he could do with his miraculous catch of fish. And he told, he told Peter, James, and John that they were going to be fishers of men. From now on, you will catch men, is what he said. So we're entering into the same chapter, but we're entering into a different pericope. <coughs> and we're transitioning. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And he stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. And he ordered him to tell no one. But go and show, but go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering. For, sorry, um, I'm on a different road. Go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering from for your cleansing, just as Moses commanded, as a testimony to them. So this is sort of foreign to us because we don't do this. But in that day, according to the Levitical law, the priest determined if someone who had had a skin infection was clean or not. <coughs> so if someone had a skin infection, according to the Levitical law, they had to go outside the camp, away from the people. And it was the priest who determined to put them in quarantine, and it would be the priest as well who would determine if they were then cleansed from that infection and no longer unclean. 
So someone with a skin infection would have been considered unclean, and when you're unclean, you can't be around anybody else. This is not this is not a spiritual thing, by the way. This is a physical type of uncleanliness in that you could infect other people with your skin infection. Skin infections are very hazardous. In fact, my three-year-old daughter just had one, so I forget the name of it, one of those childhood infections you get that you gotta look up. And uh, she gave it to two of my kids. She gave it to two of them, and they all had to have medicine. And I wasn't about to touch my lovely little three-year-old daughter with a 10-foot pole. I was like, get away from me, you're unclean. So obviously Jesus has more compassion than I do because he, he touched this guy. So, for the cultural reference there, for this guy to be accepted back into society, he needs to go be officially checked out by the priest. And also, he needs to make an offering commensurate with his cleanliness. Thanking God, and <coughs> basically, in a way, those offerings pay the priest to do what they do. So, Jesus... Jesus tells the guy to do what he's supposed to do. In accordance with what? In accordance with what the Bible says. This is what Jesus says, just as Moses commanded. I want Here's a principle. If somebody comes f to you and they, they proclaim themselves to be from God, that they're a man of God, they're a minister of God, they're on mission to God, one of the first things you need to test about them is do they follow the Scripture or not? Do they proclaim the Scripture? Here Jesus is God. He's the Messiah. And he heals this guy. And the first thing he tells him to do is go do what the Bible says. According to the law of Moses, you need to go be cleansed. Go do that. You go follow the law. You go do what the Bible says. Jesus told him not <coughs> to even tell anybody about it. Because Jesus is not trying to cause a bunch of crowds to go nuts and get excited. Because when the crowds hear about him healing, he gets rushed. All right, he gets rushed more than more than the Beatles if they had Tom Cruise with them. I mean, just boom, they're all over. So notice what Jesus does. He doesn't try to glorify himself and say, "Go tell everybody what I did for you." No, no, go do what the Bible says. Don't tell anybody. Go do what the Bible says. Just go to the priest. And this way, this man is able to be accepted back into society, back into the community, because he would have been quarantined, because he has leprosy. Now, by the way, whenever you see leprosy translated in the Bible, it could mean the disease that we call leprosy now, which I think is incurable and very contagious, and your your body, your fingers and toes start to fall off, because you, you don't, you, they get infected, because you, you get hurt, you don't feel it, because you have leprosy, and you get infected and your, your body parts start falling off. It could be that, but it could be any other kind of skin disease. And in fact, we should probably think that a lot of times it's what a skin disease that you can get over because there's a process of becoming clean after being cleansed. So I don't know what kind of skin disease this guy had, <coughs> but some kind of leprosy. Now, what would you not do to someone who's unclean, touch them. You don't touch an unclean person. It could be a woman on her period. You're not going to catch that. Now listen, nobody wants to be around a woman on her period. She's going to bite your head off and yell at you, act crazy. All right, but if you touch her, you're not going to catch it. But they weren't even they weren't supposed to touch people who were unclean until they had been cleansed. But in this case, these skin diseases are communicable, very communicable. So from a pragmatic health standpoint, you don't want to touch these people. And also from a social stigma standpoint, you don't touch an unclean person. Jesus, what's he do? He reaches out and touches the guy. <laughs> he says, be cleansed. <coughs> he reaches out his hand and touched him. Oh, you touched me. Oh, he touched me, and now, a little old hymn for you, he touched me, he reached out and touched him. Now, we know Jesus can just say the word, and the miracle happens. Like with the fever, what did he do? He rebuked the fever. He didn't have to touch the person. 
When he exercised somebody who had a demon, he didn't have to put his hands on him and say, I cast thee out, demon, I command thee, come out. He just rebuked the demon and he came out. Elsewhere in scripture, when Jesus stopped the storm, he just rebuked the weather. Hey, stop raining. And it happened. When you had the case of the centurion with a sick ser uh, servant, and he said, I'm not worthy for you to even come to my house. Just say the word and he'll be healed. You don't even have to come. Jesus could just say the word. Jesus could have just said the word here and the guy was healed. Pay attention to this. He touched him and he didn't have to. Jesus touched the leper. And Jesus' is touched. <laughs> touch cleansed the leper. Jesus is compassionate here. And this is the kind of thing, by the way, touching the leper, that's going to set off the Pharisees. This is no small faux pas. And with that, we'll end the Bible chapter of I am behind a tiny little Chevy Cruze. Get over in your little comp subcompact. Get out of my way. What state are you from? Alabama. Out of state driver. Let's see if it's a. Let's see what type of driver this is. Uh, it's not a little old lady, but it's a middle-aged woman with a strange hat. Just, just driving slow. Driving too slow, for my opinion. Right, show might be a little longer today. We'll see. So it's Walnut Avenue and Dalton's further back uh, than where I normally go. By the way, I'm recording in stereo today. Maybe that'll make a difference. Do you have a question? <laughs> Do you have a question about Christian theology or apologetics? Do you have a homemade cure for bronchitis? Either way. If you have a question about Christian theology or apologetics, you can send it to SethDunn88 at gmail.com. SethDunn88 at gmail.com. Or you can dial 470-315-0875. The Christian Commute is your theological roadside assistance. Today's question comes from Claudia in my home state of Tennessee. Claudia in my home state of Tennessee, and she makes a note. She says, listen, with Jacob and Esau, Esau sold his birthright, but then he accused Jacob of stealing his blessing. So he sold the birthright to Jacob. <coughs> but he told Jacob stole his he told Jacob that his blessing was stolen. What is the difference, Claudia asked, between a birthright and a blessing? What is the difference between a birthright and a blessing? One is uh, more formal and concrete than the other. I would say one is more ceremonial. So a birthright is a right of inheritance. When something's your right, it's just owed to you. A blessing, by the way, is not just owed to you. A blessing is given by the blesser. But un in their culture, a double portion or a better, a, a greater portion of the father's estate or assets upon his death would go to the older son. So if, <coughs> let's say, uh, Isaac had $999,000 when he died, Esau would get $666,000, and Jacob would get $333,000. The birthright goes to the oldest. The birthright is the right to the greater portion. You can't sell a blessing. Blessing something that's just given to you by the blesser. So Esau sells his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of soup. Maybe it was stew. I don't remember. I think it was stew. What, is, what good's a birthright if I die of starvation? By the way, that passage shows how unworthy Esau is, that he doesn't honor or care for his birthright, his place in, in patriarchal Israel, right? Because his, his grandfather's Abraham. That's a big deal. 
it's a, it's important it's important for anybody to get a birthright. And his birthright is apparently like, no, I'm hungry, give me some soup. <coughs> so he sold his birthright like one of these people who who say call J G Wentworth eight seven seven cash now. Okay, I'm sorry for that pause there. Uh, the veterinarian called. My cat needs a shot. It's not enough that I got six kids that got to go to the doctor and dentist. Now I got a cat that needs a shot too. It never ends. Birthrights, birthrights, birthrights. Esau despised his birthright, which is pretty low. He's a pretty low guy. <laughs> you know, we, we don't think much of Jacob because Jacob's a trickster and who does very unscrupulous and dishonest things throughout his life. But Esau is uh, no saint either. Um, I guess Jacob is a saint because he's a set-apart part of God's people. Esau founded the Edomites. Anyway, J.G. Wentworth, let's say you've got a settlement. Let's say you've got a structured settlement. Let's say uh, an 18-wheeler ran over you. And you called, you you were injured, called Pritchard. All right. If you're from if you're from North Georgia, you've seen injured, called Pritchard. And Pritchard arranged from you for the trucking company to get three thousand dollars a month for the rest of your life. So now you have that right. You have that entitlement because the trucking the 18 wheeler ran over you. But you listen. You you weren't a very responsible person to begin with. You weren't exactly working. The injury lawyer is the best thing that ever happened to you. And now you, you your credit's bad. You've overspent your money. You don't want to wait your whole life to get $3,000 a month. You want your money now. So you call J.G. Wentworth, 877-CASH-NOW. And J.G. Wentworth says, we'll give you $200,000 for your structured settlement. You We're going to pay you $200,000 and then... The $3,000 a month the trucking company gives you for the rest of your life comes to us. You can sell that because it's a legal thing owed to you. All right? That's a birthright. Just from being born, <coughs> just for being born, the firstborn had the right to the birthright. Right? The, the double inheritance. Now, the blessing is something more informal that is given by the father or by the patriarchal type person was it uh <coughs> let's see here I think it was Jacob in in Egypt who gave a blessing to the younger of Jacob's sons because he had Ephraim and Manasseh and Jacob switched him around and said oh, I'm gonna, I bless the older one instead of the younger one A blessing's not an inheritance. It's basically just saying, like, good luck. Something's going to happen to you. I bless you. I'm trying to think of a parallel for today. Uh, if you, when I wanted to marry my wife, I asked my father-in-law, hey, is it okay with you if I marry Laura? That's my wife's name. I don't know. I always say my wife. I don't know if I've ever mentioned My wife's name is Laura. She's a real person. Who uh, has a name. <coughs> He's like, I, um, I'm buying an engagement ring because I want to marry Laura. Laura, is that okay with you? Now, if he just said no, legally, we still could have gotten married. He could have said no. If some, if some jack wagon wants to marry my daughter, who can I marry your daughter? No, jack wagon. No, you sure can't. I do not give you my blessing. But when you're giving somebody your blessing, you're saying, I approve of this. And I'm going to help you along in life, morally speaking. I'm not promising to say pay for the wedding or anything, but there you go. It's a blessing. People say, may God bless you, sir. Oh, it's not a material thing that you're giving someone. It's, it's immaterial. It's your approval. It's you saying, I want God to go with you. It could... <coughs> <laughs> it could come with a, a prophecy. I bless you and you will have many kids. All right. But that's the difference. One is about an inheritance of things. That's the birthright. And the other is not about an inheritance of things. So, uh, good question, Claudia. I bet a lot of people have wondered about that over the years. But hey, wait a minute. What's the difference here? The immediate readers would have understood, but... 
that's not the society we live in. We don't live in a society where lepers are walking around saying, Leper coming! Leper coming! Move out of the way! Unclean! Unclean! I mean, in today's society, you might just get a funny look at the in the aisle at Ingalls. Like, what are you doing? This, uh, what are you, what's wrong? What kind of fungus do you have? They, we live in a, a different place. We have dermatologists and probate lawyers. Dermatologists and probate lawyers. Different time. Good question. That's it. The inbox is empty. I don't have anything for tomorrow. I don't know if I'll go to work tomorrow. <coughs> it depends on how late I stay up doing uh, budgetary things. I have a lot of work for work. I wasn't planning to leave right when I did, but I had to go to the trophy shop. This trophy shop in Dalton, it's, it's a small business. It's like a dude who runs a trophy shop. And he's there when he's there, and he's not when he's not. It's not like Walmart or ordering trophies online. It's like, hey, if he can work in, he can work in. And he worked me in, so very happy about that. Got my trophy for my game. So since I had to leave the office to go to the trophy shop, I said, ah, I ain't going to drive back to the office. I'll just go work from home. My wife's got to take my son to basketball practice anyway. I'm <coughs> super busy. Basketball, basketball season is encroaching on soccer season. In a way, it didn't, it didn't happen this way last year. I think we were done with uh, soccer by now. Worlds are colliding. So worlds are colliding. I'm trying to coach two things at once. Three things at once if you call futsal, which hasn't started yet. All right, let's go to today's show title, show topic, Lessened Exposure. Lessened Exposure. As I mentioned on the previous show, Sunday I was supposed to be presented to the church as the latest member of the church, but I had to leave early. But anyway, now I'm a member of a new church, right? And here's how our church services go, in case you're wondering. They start playing the piano. They, the lady, the woman who plays the piano. The woman starts playing the piano. The preacher's daughter. To let us know, like, hey, stop socializing and milling around. Sit down take your seat. We have an order of worship. Someone comes up, welcomes everybody. We have an announcement. They make the announcement. Then, somebody else comes up says, turn to whatever hymn in the hymn book. We have a book. We have two books. We have two hymn books. We have hymns of grace, and we have the celebration hymnal. Turn into whatever page on this hymnal, and we're going to sing this song. The congregation sings the song. And then we sit down. And then somebody comes up and does an Old Testament scripture reading. We just finished Judges. And now we're in Samuel. I think we're Joshua Judges Ruth. First, second Kings, first, second Samuel. Joshua Judges Ruth. I don't know why. I, I don't guess we're doing it in order. I never thought about it. But we read, they just read a chapter of scripture. Just reads it. Not a sermon on it. Just reads a chapter out of the Old Testament. They might say one or two sentences about it after. That person goes and sits down. We stand up again. We sing another hymn. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Then, the preacher gets up, and he preaches a sermon from the Bible. Here is the text we are preaching from, and he preaches it. When he is done, we sing another song, there's a benediction, and we go home. Every couple weeks, we take communion. I think this Sunday is a communion Sunday, so I think we'll do that before the last hymn. We do that every single time. There are no, I mean, there are lights. There's light fixtures. <coughs> there are no stage lights. There is no smoke machine. The only instrument we have is a piano. I, nobody, I, it would be fine. If somebody wanted to play the guitar, I don't think anybody would care. I just don't know if anybody is able to. That's fine. Piano and a hymn book reading from the Bible, sermon from the Bible. That's what we do. <coughs> there is 
adult Sunday school. Everybody sits in the same room. We go to the fellowship hall. Um, we just did a lesson on the meekness, biblical meekness, the meekness of Jesus from the Sermon on the Mount. We just did that. The one before, we were uh, in a John Owen book, of how, <laughs> sort of a how to be a church member book that John Owen wrote. And uh, <coughs> actually, I'm not sure what we're starting next. They gave me the book. I think the book was from League Ear. It's in my, it's in my view. And all the adults are in one Sunday school. The kids are in another. I think they, they just now separated from upstairs and downstairs, the older kids and the younger kids, because we're starting to get more kids. That's it. There is no scheme. There is no growth program other than the, the Great Commission. The, the, the growth program is the Great Commission. Go out and evangelize people, baptize and disciple them. That's growth program. There is no consultant. There is no assistant to the assistant minister. There is no pancakes and pajama day. There is no swimsuit day or beach day for the kids' Sunday school theme. Whatever. They're, they're, <coughs> it's just come to Sunday school or not. There is no theme. There's no breaking people up by age groups. There's no ball pit in the lobby. In fact, the lobby is too small to have a ball pit. Nobody, there's nobody putting a ball pit in the lobby that says put a white ball in when you invite somebody and put a red ball in when, when somebody gets saved. There's nobody telling you to sign on to this website and then put your address in the website and then identify your neighbors who you're going to invite to church and have dinner with and we're going to track them on the website and pray about it. There is no praise team of undiscerning people singing whatever they're told to sing. There is no capital campaign fund where we pretend that Nehemiah means that we need to build a new building. I think the entire budget for the year of the church is less than $10,000. There is no membership in the Georgia Baptist or Southern Baptist Convention. There is no Lifeway Sunday School material. There is no Ladies Beth Moore Bible Study. I do think there's a Ladies Bible Study. I just don't think we'd never do Beth Moore. There is no Priscilla Shiver on Wednesday. There is a Wednesday Bible study. I haven't gone because I have soccer practice on Wednesday, but they don't do Priscilla Shiver stuff. There are regular called church meetings if something has to be budgeted or changed or decided, like voting on a new member. In other words, all the stuff that has been happening to me over the last 10 years that I've been doing this podcast at church that pisses me off. And I don't mean like pisses me off like somebody going slow in the fast lane. I mean like zealous for the kingdom of God and the purity of the local church when somebody is doing something awful. Somebody's turning it into a show. Somebody's turning it into a business. All that stuff that has been happening, that I have been exposed to for the last 10 years, like the time I went to church in Gatlinburg and they played the Friends theme as a sermon introduction. They don't do that there. They have the regulative principle. I should say we don't do that. <laughs> I have been to church there most every Sunday for the past few months. 
And I don't think I need to walk my kids out of this service. Or we have to keep, skip kids Sunday school today because they're doing something stupid. Like pajama day. Or whatever gimmick they're doing. There is no gimmick. There's no, there is not a gimmick. I have gone to church for several weeks in a row and not been pissed off. Just glad to be there. My exposure to the awful things in American evangelicalism has been significantly lessened. I do not have anything <coughs> that I think I need to reform about my local church. Now, it's a Reformed Baptist church, so we're always going to say Semper Reformanda. Let's, let's, you know, let's constantly be reforming. Let's clean it up if there's something we need to be cleaned up. But I just there's nothing out there like we got to do something about this. There are no Freemasons. Not on the security team, because there is no security team. But, you know, there's guys with guns, but there's no security team. That's another thing. There's no parking lot team. There's no security team. There's no spiritual gifts inventory. This, that, and the other. If somebody, if we need to do something, somebody just does it. But there's no Freemasons there. The pastor told me that we would not ever accept Freemasons in the membership unless they repented. We would, of course, if they want to come sit in church, anybody can come sit in church if they want to and hear the gospel. Unlike some churches in town, we don't have that opinion. Pretty much every, I don't want to sound like Cal J. Howard here, every traumatic, triggering thing that has happened to me in church in the last 10 years has not been happening. My exposure to the radioactivity of American evangelicalism has been less. I feel like I don't have as much to blog. <coughs> I really feel like I don't have as much to podcast about. Because I'd do a podcast before, I'd say, hey, this is how you need to reform the music at your church. You need to get this many people at your church meeting, and you need to say this, and you need to do this. You know what? I hear something about Bethel, I'll hear something about Hillsong, and I might not even share it. I don't need the people on my Facebook feed to look up Hillsong in Bethel. Because we don't sing Hillsong in Bethel where we go and everybody there knows their band. I listened to a great podcast from Chris Roseboro today from a woman who came out, uh, or he was analyzing a video from a woman who came out of the Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. Yes, B-S-S-M, that's a real thing. Bethel School of Supernatural Ministry. A woman who came out of that was telling about all their charlatanry and unbiblical things. Four years ago, I'd have been lying to share him. Like, this is why we got to get Bethel music out. <coughs> Y'all can play all the Bethel music you want at XYZ Baptist Church. That radiation is not on me. It's radioactive. We're talking about exposure, right? If you're around something radioactive, it gets on you makes your hair fall out and it makes you sick and how do you get better how do you get better and it's not Aaron Brockovich winning you a million dollar judgment either you get away from the radioactive thing and I am away from the radioactivity and let me tell you the lesson exposure it's like it's like when you're eating healthy. When you you know when you start watching your diet, and you're like, you know, I haven't been eating real good. Let me cut out the skittles. Let me stop eating so much soup and ramen noodles. There's too much sodium and preservatives in that. Let me start eating some fruits and vegetables. I need more fruits and vegetables. I need some lean meat. Cut out the candy. Cut out the sugary drinks. And you know what? You just feel better. Let me just tell you this, people. 
some of you guys out there that have been unwilling to pull the trigger in your life because you're in a church that won't be reformed and you're subtly fighting that battle. I'm not telling you when to leave because I, I think at your local church you have a covenant relationship there and you need to fight to reform it. But eventually, sometimes you need to realize it's not going to work out. And if you just get away from the things in church that are radioactive and causing your hair to fall out, you're going to feel so much better on Sunday. Can, can I tell you this? <coughs> I want to invite people to church now. Wait a second, I thought you went to Reformed Baptist Church. You're frozen and chosen. What are you inviting people? No, I want to invite people to church. Come on. There's nothing that I would be ashamed of to invite somebody there. I'm not going to invite somebody there and be embarrassed by the music. Embarrassed by the preaching. So, why am, I, why am I bringing all this up? And they were like, I don't like to make a show about me. Because a lot <coughs> of the content on this podcast over the years has come from personal experience. Going to First Baptist Woodstock and Ergen Cantor coming to preach going to Expedition Church and they put a Roman Catholic in the pulpit. Going to Expedition Church and the preacher plays a clip of Star Wars because he thinks this is going to communicate the message. Going to Roland Springs and it being full of Freemasons. Going to First Baptist and sitting there and and watching them turn on a haze machine, which, by the way, they don't have anymore. They got rid of it to their credit. Watching them turn on a haze machine at the time of the closing hymn or closing contemporary Christian song. Watching someone who has a stellar reputation in the church belt out Hillsong like there's nothing wrong with it. every little thing that I get on here and say, hey, this is what's happening in American evangelicalism. This is what's happening in your church. And you got to stop it. Here's how we fix it. Guys, that hadn't happened to me in months. So I don't know what I'm going to talk about. That's why I bring that up. I don't know what I'm going to say <laughs> about they're doing this at children's ministry. Here's what we need to do instead. They're doing this on Wednesday nights. Here's what we need to do instead. Feel good. Lessened exposure to the cancerous radi radiation of Big Eva, the SBC, Nichols, and Noses culture. Feels great. Feels healthy. Feels good. And my wife, my poor beleaguered wife, who just thinks I'm going to get kicked out of somewhere else. I'm like, no, you don't understand. You don't understand, oh poor beleaguered wife. I'm finally around a group of people who think like me. But it's not important if they think like me, is it? It's like what? It's that the Bible is the focus. Because you know, when it comes down to it, everybody's different and people have different styles and people approach things differently. But if everyone has a dedication to the Bible is how we're going to run this church, not the latest, greatest scheme, not something else, just the Bible, you're going to come together in one accord with Koinonia. And look, I'm, I'm all calm. I'm running into traffic. I just, I just got stuck in traffic. Whatever, I'll be okay. But that's all I got to say. But So send me a question. 
Thanks for listening to The Christian Commute. If you're local to Georgia, come visit my church. Come hang out with me. Come to, we'll, go, we'll go out afterward if you're near. If you want to come see your uh, favorite car podcaster. Can I still call myself a blogger? What is it? Is it November? Ooh, I got to at least write my annual Worst Christian of the Year blog. Guess who's going to win? <coughs> Thanks for listening to The Christian Commute. Lord willing, I'll be back with you again I don't know, either tomorrow or Tuesday. We'll see how late I stay up. As always, God bless. And as always, remember, Christianity is not about getting saved. It's about being saved.